Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! Folks, welcome back to Cosmic Shenanigans, where not only am I up to shenanigans of cosmic proportions, but also I have a special guest who is also going to be up to some cosmic shenanigans himself. Uh, this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have author John Urbansick woo -hoo, woo -hoo, <laughs> read a story, which is a cosmic horror story of his own, and we're going to discuss it and why it is cosmic horror and how it fits into the, the canon of, of modern cosmic horror literature and how uh, weird fantasy and weird fiction in general overlap in the great cosmic awesomeness that is cosmic horror fiction. So welcome to the show, John. Well, thank Yay. you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> I gave her a big smile. Yes, yes. It, it's all, all part of radio. I am... Not I I don't have a whole lot of guests on, so you could tell that this is this is like a new and ex exciting thing. But as I mentioned, John has a story for us that he's going to read. Should I start with the story now? I think you right should start away. with the story. Let's no do that. Or anything, just go straight into it. Well, tell us a little bit about the story first. That would probably well. Be the good. story's really short, so if I tell you much, I'll give it all away. Has it been? But it's has based it appeared on a true anywhere? Story. It's based on a true story because it with is, John, you never quite can tell. It is. I believe it's one of the stories on my Patreon account. Okay, but so we and we'll come back to that. We'll talk about your patron account after, and and it might be included in a collection later. But at this cool. point, that's it. It's it's short. It's based on a true story, and afterwards, I can tell you all the parts of it that are entirely true. <laughs> okay, and all the parts of it that are not entirely true. Okay, and the parts that are maybe a little bit true. And I would consider it a cosmic horror romance. See, I like that. I like that. That's one of the things we try to do on the show is explore different uh, ways that cosmic horror permeates culture. And I do think there are cosmic horror romances. The guys who directed The Endless uh, did a cosmic horror romance as one of the movies, which is not directly related to that series. Um, not that we've talked about it too much on the show, but I do like the idea of a cosmic horror romance. I think that's kind of cool. So take it away, John. It's called... A Ride Behind... See, normally I, when I did this on my own show, when I used to do ink stains and mm -hmm. I used to do readings, I could cut out all the mistakes. All the little like hiccups? <laughs> we can have Dave do that. All right. A Ride Beyond Twilight. I came upon a hut made of sticks twisted around each other to make walls and windows and enough of a doorway I could squeeze through without stabbing myself. Inside, I found more of the same. Sticks wrapped around each other to form sculptures, a dancer and a bull and a sickle moon. Odd, maybe a little frightened, certainly mystified. I nearly believed I was imagining it when I heard the musicality of a woman whispering my name. Her whispering sounded exactly like what a man dreams of hearing under a midnight moon, all honey and bourbon promises. But something about the situation lent her voice a menacing edge that's difficult to describe. Almost like how you might tell coffee first thing in the morning just how beautiful it is right before consuming every last drop. I admit I froze. I have a tongue and can use it when appropriate, but just then I could conjure no words, not even a breath. I felt her whisper at my ear when she said it again, my name plain as day and just as simple, but she said it with intention and a strong undercurrent of possession. Though I spun, I caught only the barest glimpse of her shadow and the echo of her giggling. I knew then the danger I was in and I muttered half-born curses as I pushed out a breath and narrowed my eyes against the stark of twilight. I have seen dusk saturate the world in a golden amber hue, giving vibrancy to all the greenery and thickness to the very air. This was not like that at all. It was barren, dry, cracked, and lifeless. All color was drained and subdued. When I found courage to speak, not found so much as manufactured and faked, I said, show yourself. I said, who are you? I said, what do you want? If I had the strength or the wisdom, I would have gotten back on my bike and ridden away as far as my little Indian could take me. Instead, 
I stood there as if awaiting an actual answer, as if expecting that any response would be sane and comprehensible. But this was not the start of the conversation. This was no innocent flirtation. Names are powerful things. I'd asked for hers, demanded it. She already knew mine. She knew my weaknesses and my strengths. She knew my hopes and fears. She knew the color of my dreams, and she would rob me of them as casually as picking a pocket. I stood in the hut of sticks, my anger dead as a rock. Behind me, no, behind me again, off to one side or another, I closed my eyes and stopped trying to see her. Whatever beauty my mind applied to her, painted over her like makeup and glamour, would do more to tempt me than her terrible visage. Surely she matched the atmosphere, the pallor and coarseness of the world about me. Her lips would not be lush and red, her hair not long and cascading like liquid amber. Her flesh would not be soft and supple and would not invite touch the way her voice so masterfully implied. Night arrived. The stark, blanched countryside was blanketed in ebon, ebon death shrouds, and a chill tickled my bones. And she kissed me. She kissed me like a lover, deep and thoroughly, from the skin to the soul. I felt my strength, my substance, slipping into her mouth, but I was unable to resist. In her kiss, I tasted the seven sisters of the Pleiades, and the dust of the Sahara, and the sweetness of a good Italian Prosecco with a million bubbles in every bottle. The scents of cinnamon and vanilla and cherry lip... The scents of cinnamon and vanilla and cherry lip gloss overwhelmed me. In my mind, with my eyes shut tight, I could see the crystalline forests of a distant planet being flung between a pair of binary stars. I fell into her, as if into a black hole. Then she was gone, and I was staring. I'm going to try that again. Then she was gone, and I was on my back, staring up at familiar constellations. A star fell. No, a meteorite fell, a rock no bigger than my fist, but it brightened half the night sky. An actual star fell, so distant it must have fallen a thousand years ago. I struggled to catch my breath, to sit upright, to crawl out of the hut of sticks. I can't say why I'm still alive, but I'll never fully regain myself. A piece of me is lost forever, stolen away, leaving a shredded, tattered chasm under my ribs. I'm able to whisper her name, her name, which maybe she never meant to reveal. And it's your name, but you'll never answer. <laughs> now, there's a number of things that I think qualify that as a cosmic horror story, and we're going to talk about those things. Um, I find your style to be somewhat reminiscent of uh, like William Hope Hodgson in this particular case. I mean, generally speaking, I think you're more Br Ray Bradbury than Hodgson, but um, <laughs> but there is, an, there is an element of that. There's an element of the surreal, mm -hmm. uh, and there's an element of the fantastic, which in Lovecraft's work didn't always come across as, I mean, despite the fact that it was, you know, supernatural with, with fantastic monsters and these sort of terrifying, you know, gods from beyond, there wasn't always a sense of the awe that fantasy brings to a story. And I think that, and, and, and I say that carefully because I'm saying by awe, I don't mean that sort of you know, terrified awe that these things are out there. I mean the sense of wonder, maybe. The sense mm -hmm. of beauty in something strange and cosmic. Well, the difference cosmic. between horror and dark fantasy is horror wants to inspire dread. Exactly. And dark fantasy is more to inspire awe. And I tend toward that more often than yes. horror. Now, I that's not to say that the two can't overlap, because they, they have in the past. Uh, I in one of the early episodes of Cosmic Shenanigans, I said that a lot of weird fiction and a lot of Clark Ashton Smith's work, I mean, to me, that's dark fantasy, but there are elements of cosmic horror which I think qualify. And, and like you said, one of them is a, is a feeling of dread, which is present in your story. First, let's talk about, though, the parts that are real and the parts <laughs> that aren't, because this sounds like quite an adventure. Well, first I want to point out that I don't believe, I, I believe there was more kissing in this story than in all of Lovecraft's work combined. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I'm not sure there's ever been any kissing, really. Right. So, so it really was based on a true story in that 
I had gone, I was living in Virginia at the time, and I had gone to a house museum somewhere near Norfolk. Okay. And I wandered through the house, and there were some really nice and interesting things, and the architecture was good. Ultimately, I decided this would be a great place to live. But, you know. It wasn't for sale. They didn't give it to me. <laughs> So Damn it. I went outside into the gardens and there were, you know, a lot of little nice things and plants and roses and stuff like that. And then I turned a corner on the outside and suddenly there was a hut of sticks. I That is the part that's true. <laughs> it completely took me by surprise, which is weird because I should not have been surprised. There were books about the stick work uh -huh. and the artist who did the stick work, who I cannot remember his name now, uh, inside the museum shop inside the house. So I had already seen that there was a book about this. So I wasn't, I was surprised to see it, but I wasn't sitting there saying, I've just entered a Carl Edward Wagner store. <laughs> right. <didn't> <laughs> and I also happened to have just read or reread The Sticks. Right. Like that week. And I had just read, uh, I think it might have been it, one, of, one of the Lovecraft stories. One of, one of the, like, the, the short ones. The, one of the main ones, though. Right, right. One of the Cthulhu Mythos ones? It, it was definitely a Cthulhu one. And so I had that whole cosmic horror type of thing going on in my head anyway. And so when I, when I started to write the story, I, I realized pretty quickly that it had to be related just because of the hut made of sticks. Yes. So, you know, and I gave myself, you know, I gave myself an Indian motorcycle, or I gave the narrator an Indian motorcycle. <laughs> um, I personally didn't mind one either, but um, I don't believe they sponsor writers. No, not that I'm aware of. Indian? People in Indian, if you want to sponsor a writer, I... <laughs> He's doing a lot I'm, of traveling this I'm summer, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I work cheap. So I, so I incorporated a lot of, a lot of different aspects of various cosmic things, but I also didn't rely on what had already been done before. So, like, when I say that the uh, the I, I taste the Pleiades and the Sahara and the, the mm -hmm. Prosecco and all of that, I don't think I got that from somewhere else. That's just right. that's just me. That's just, that, that's actually from people I've actually kissed. So that part is real, too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of the bits, a lot of the pieces would have been influenced by the stuff that I've read. And I have not read a ton of cosmic horror prior to just a couple of years ago where, I, where I've been reading more. I've been reading right. Brian Hodge and read some of the uh, some of the stuff that you've talked about. I've gone through all of the, uh, because of you, Aww. I've gone through all of the Conan stories by Robert E. Howard, which you, you talk about how you think there's elements of dark, of cosmic horror in those stories. Yes. I go through them and I'm thinking that there is undoubtedly cosmic horror elements in these stories. Oh, so yeah. These are cosmic horror stories told from the point of view of, of a sword sorcery type thing. Right. It's, and it's, and that's what that's what I find fascinating about this particular subgenre is that a lot of people have, have said to me over the last year or so that, oh, I, I never really read a whole lot of cosmic horror, but I'm starting to find it everywhere now. I think it's because there are cosmic horror elements and probably always have been in, in, in a number of things, but it was just never called that. Much like a lot of things that are technically horror yeah. are not called horror. Um, there's a lot of gray areas. Now, one of the things I do want to go back to with the sticks, because we did cover sticks in an earlier episode in Cosmic Shenanigans. Mm -hmm. um, and the sticks themselves, uh, which predate Blair Witch Project, by the way, out there for people out there who are curious. And, and my sticks were not like the sticks in the story of the sticks. Because I, I was uh, going to ask you, there is, to me, that is one of the cosmic horror elements, but because of how I view the meaning of those of those sticks in both sticks by Carl Edward Wagner and the Blair Witch Project, to me, those stick figures represent uh, symbols. They represent an old language mm -hmm. or uh, old, um, it's not quite poppet magic, although I guess it could be depending on what shape the sticks are, but there is a certain language in them that, that uh, Wagner alludes to in sticks and that I've, I've sort of alluded to in, in, in my own work that there's um, something ancient there, a kind of nature magic. Is that what 
you're going for in the story, or do they represent something else to you? A little bit, because at the very beginning, I, um, the narrator comes upon a hut made of sticks. Mm -hmm. This story could not have happened if he wasn't inside that hut. It right. Would, it would not have happened if he stayed outside looking at it. It would not have happened if he had stopped at a derelict gas station on the side of I-73 mm -hmm. or whatever. It had to be inside the house of sticks and the, the symbols I, I included symbols the dancer the bull the sickle moon right. I don't remember now if I had something specific in mind with each of those but I probably did because I know how I am but there was because they, they are very specific and they do in many cases refer to ancient religions I mean the symbols themselves and they're all old symbols I mean the and and I can you know, like the dancer, dancer is a common symbol in some of my story, and the moon is also. And people could say that the bull is because I, you know, lived in Spain for a year. But actually, this was bef this I wrote before I even knew I was going to go to Spain. So the, that that was not an influence here. So it might have been the universe, the cosmic forces in the universe aligning to tell me, "Hey, buddy, get ready." Well, here's an interesting <laughs> here's an interesting little <laughs> trivia aside about bulls, the temple of the bull in Egypt mm -hmm. is, from what I understand, the one place in, in the ancient Egyptian architecture that they found where the vaults inside do not contain people. They contain the remains of animals which conspiracy theorists claim are hybrid animals. Like, um, uh -huh. if not outright shape-shifting things, then the kinds of hybrids that are shown on uh, the hieroglyph, the hieroglyphic uh, walls, you know, where you've got like an animal head and a person body. Right. And not only that, because there are bones, uh, multiple types of animals, but some of them look like they're fused together, like they were part of the same skeleton. And there is... Uh, bitumen, if I'm saying it right, um, sprinkled across the top mm -hmm. because theoretically the bitumen keeps the bones from knitting back together and rising again, which is the theory. And that is, and it's called the temple of the bull, even though there is no bull. To me, it can't get much more cosmic horror than that in real life is the idea that ancient gods are being kept from rising. And, and have they been moved? Has the bitumen been disturbed? Or mm. should we be worried now about like Bath's followers I'm not rising sure. out of the, out of the uh, desert? And I don't think they've been disturbed. I, I could be wrong, but I, I think that we don't have permission to uh, take anything out of there, so I think it is still as it was, but th that's the legend about that particular area, is that there are a number of animal bones, and the conspiracy theorists think that they may be parts of the one skeleton, as opposed to a dumping ground for animals because uh, there are warnings not to take the bones out. So I thought that was kind of interesting and, and maybe subconsciously you're tapping into the Don't cosmic the horror. Out. Don't take the bones. I have an idea for a new story. <laughs> and you heard it here, folks, on Cosmic Shenanigans. <laughs> the inspiration for a new story. Um, the inspiration is great because it works like that. The slightest little thing. We could both go like after we're done with this interview we could both sit down and, and spend the next hour writing a short story based mm -hmm. on that on that one set one detail yep and they would be entirely different stories we could uh even have a collection we could make an anthology we can make an anthology we can invite other people to write their ancient egyptian morphing <laughs> bone beast beast things yeah that would be kind of delightful i would read that I would read that. Yeah. I would write that. So let's talk about the woman. The woman. The woman in the story. She actually lets him live. She does. But she doesn't leave him whole. Yes. And as we've mentioned in the past episodes, there is an element of cosmic horror which explores the possibility that there may be fates worse than death. Uh... In a lot of Lovecraft stuff, as, you know, as we've talked about, the the idea that these things existed was supposed to be like the punchline of the horror. You know, like, oh my God, there are these ancient beings out there. And, you know, how can we ever go back to a normal life now that we know? Well, how can we ever go back to telling a story like that now that we already have the Lovecraft stories from decades ago? Exactly. That's why 
that's why cosmic art and other all other genres have to continue to evolve based on what came before them. That's a great point, really, because uh, one of the uh, evolutions I'm seeing with modern cosmic art is that it's gone beyond just the great reveal that the thing exists to examining the effect uh, or the changes that are wrought by the discovery of this this thing that uh, that exists and, and how it changes people. And in fact, in some of the episodes, we've actually talked about uh, the effect on the being itself, the entity itself. But in this particular case, he she takes something from him. She has the ability to see when the the part that you read before about the Pleiades and uh, the desert. To me, that was I think one of the first cosmic horror elements as I saw it because it was uh, something infinite. It showed her as being a a, a creature of a kind of cosmic infiniteness, a kind of power mm -hmm. like that, that uh, was opening his eyes, which is a lot of, you know, a lot of cosmic horror is, is, although it is, it goes beyond just the great reveal. The great reveal is a big part of it. You know, it is a big part of that, that sudden knowledge. How do you see her? Is she a goddess, a monster? Uh, who is she to you? I don't see her as a monster. Okay. That doesn't mean she's not a goddess, uh, but I do see her as as partly human. Okay. Or at least you know, in in this form, she's partly human because while he tastes the Pleiades and the Sahara and the, and the Prosecco, which, like I said, could could just be any girl you run into in, in <laughs> Italy or, or France or or New England. <laughs> um, the scents of cinnamon and vanilla and cherry lip gloss. And I added the cherry lip gloss specifically because I wanted to ground her a little bit. Yes, but yes. But that's one of the images, it's one of two images in this story that I, I wasn't sure if I should keep. And I'm, I'm actually a little disappointed in myself because I'm reading an older version. There's, there's a newer draft of this story that eliminated the line with the coffee. Oh, I like the line with the coffee, though. I took that line out because I, I felt like it it took away a little bit from the character and from the atmosphere, the, the sense that it was building. See, that's interesting, because to me, I thought that it established a kind of cosmic hierarchy. Uh, we, as the, theoretically, the apex sentient life form on this planet, um, <laughs> theoretically. theoretically, do plenty of things that... Um, are indifferent to creatures that we think of as being kind of beneath us every day. Like, it wouldn't necessarily keep you up at night to squish a spider that was crawling around in your house. I, it might keep some people up at night. It, it certainly keep doesn't... Me up. I would much prefer to let them out and keep eating the bugs that I don't like, please. It would not keep me up. I'd gods. squish that mother. <laughs> um, but, you know, there you don't necessarily watch the ground to make sure you're not stepping on ants. You know, it just wouldn't necessarily occur to you all the time, especially if you're in a hurry. Things like that. Um, to me, we do consume other things without thinking of the effect that it has. Uh, and essentially what you're doing is you're introducing somebody who, in a very natural human way, does that, and then comes across a creature who does that to him. Um, who treats him essentially the same way. But doesn't actually take every last drop. But exactly. Not in this case. Exactly. But and why is that, do you think? Well, partly because how could he be telling this story if he didn't survive it? Good point. Good point. I mean, that's a big part of it. it uh, there may be another hundred that she took every last drop, but they can't tell but their not. story. Exactly. Because they're dead. <laughs> Could it be, too, possibly, that the human part of her, the cherry lip gloss part of her, um, remembers? Well, I did call it a cosmic horror romance. That's true. So there That's is a true. potential that she she has some sort of emotion or feeling. And I also have, you know, at the end, she's taken this from him, but she's also given him her name without ever saying it. He knows her name now. Which, um, in as I believe we may have discussed this. If we haven't, we should discuss it now. In a lot of magical systems that exist currently in the world, names are an incredibly powerful thing. Yes. Um, in demonology, to know a demon's name is to have control over it. 
and to have power to summon it or banish it from a certain location in uh, a lot of, you know, magic, both fact, you know, fact as, as it stands and fiction names carried it words themselves carried weight they carried power and uh i think that it's touched on a little bit in lovecraft that there are certain gods that they don't know their names because they've never been given that information mm -hmm. i think what makes this a love story and not something cosmically vampiric is that she does give him her name whether she meant to or not she shares with him she she gave up a little part of herself to take yeah. part of him away. But also at the end, it does say she'll never answer. So he doesn't gain that control. The, the names might be powerful, but he doesn't have the power to use it. See, I like that. Because again, look, that's that's a cosmic horror thing. You can know the names of... Even the names of God. Um, the closest that we have in the Hebrew and Judeo-Christian religion to calling God anything is Yahweh. And even that... They want to strike from religious texts because uh, we're theoretically not supposed to know the name of God because it would have power over creation and destruction. My guess is that that's not the name. Probably not. No, it's a it's a a nickname, I guess, for lack of a better word. But it's there is like something. When you call someone John when you call them Jack. Nobody exactly. Nobody calls me Jack, but but I had friends whose names were John and they were called Jack. It's not really their name. You have no power. <laughs> yes. Well, that's the thing of it. Yeah. I mean, a name a name carries a certain sense of identity. I like that you never tell us what her name is, though. I never tell you what her name is, and I never tell you what the narrator's name is, either. Exactly. I just, exactly. just speaks, I did this, I did that, because he's not going to think what, what his own name is. But I've just had another thought about this story that I don't think I realized before, and it was it's only applicable by, by reading it wrongly. Okay, okay. This story could really be about loss. There's a part of him yeah. that has been taken away. She'll never answer. Maybe she didn't survive. Oh. Maybe this is a story about grief. Maybe I wrote this story to, uh, a year or two before I had to do my own grief. To deal, yeah. Um, yeah, that would, that would definitely, that would put a, an interesting, that would put an interesting spin on it. It would also... Uh, play into a little bit of what we talked about, not last week, but I believe it might have been the episode before, where some modern cosmic horror looks at the not just the effect of cosmic entities on humanity, but humanity's effect on cosmic entities. Mm -hmm. And in one of the movies that uh, we discussed, there was an entity that loved another one and lost it, lost her, I guess, uh, and that it was a driving force for that entity, the same as it would be for a human being. And the sort of cosmic horror aspect of that, the implication of that was that gods are no more immune to things than we are. And all of the things that we look to a god to be and do, they're not. They're not those things. And that means we're not safe. There is no benevolent, all-powerful figure that is immune to heartbreak or guilt or rash decisions, you know? The Greek gods certainly weren't. No. And the Norse gods certainly weren't. No. And, and most, most uh, polytheistic religions, the gods weren't. And there's something, I think, comforting in some way about that, but not on a cosmic horror scale. I think in a lot of cosmic horror... There's something sort of the the gods were almost I think in polytheistic religions they're almost like demigods they're they're like they 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 were susceptible to human problems but they had powers they were like superheroes kind of yeah. uh, in cosmic horror they're set up to be something so infinitely large and powerful and sort of all-consuming in some ways that the idea that they would have weaknesses instead of being comforting is almost kind of terrifying well the gods and the co cosmic gods in that sense would be like going back to stepping on ants forget about the ants because we can actually see them right would be like the microbes living on our skin yes or or in our digestive tract mm-hmm 
we have no, not only do we have no knowledge or really care about them, we have no idea how they really work. I mean, right. And I mean that on, like an, on an individual way. Scientifically, we might understand right. what they're doing, how they live, and stuff like that. But we as individual people are never really conscious of the religions that are being prayed to exactly inside our gallbladder. Right, right. And there is something terrifying, I think, in that respect, that, like, to have set up a god as being so powerful, and there's, uh, the reason I think that that is done is that there's a certain comfort in knowing that, you know, there's something, a higher power out there, what people tend to think of as the higher power that sort of oversees everything and, and is there when you need it, and even if it's something... First, that it's indifferent to you is scary, and that it's fallible. That uh, it, so I guess there it, it introduces that implication that maybe there's something even more powerful, and if if something powerful enough to be a god is indifferent, then what is something that the gods pray to going to be like? Exactly. Um, what do you think is the strongest cosmic horror element? in your particular story? What do you think, like what to you when you read it, what made you think, yep, this is a cosmic horror story? I think it's the atmosphere. Okay, all right. I think it's it's the way that I set it up as, as a mysterious. It's, the whole thing is a mystery. It starts off with I came upon a hut of sticks mm -hmm. and doesn't ever explain that in any way. Like why it's and there, who built it. it gets more mysterious as it goes. And then there are no answers. There, There's nothing answered in this story. The only answer is what kind of motorcycle is he driving? That's true. You're right. It is It is uh, a continual presentation of what ifs and, uh, here, and mysteries that are unfolding but not really giving you any more knowledge. To me, the hut of sticks is a doorway. Uh, yes. Which a lot of cosmic horror, you know, utilizes in one way or another that there are different kinds of doorways between worlds and dimensions, and uh, that to me is one of the one of the initial elements I think that categorizes it as cosmic horror. Where? Yeah, definitely. And here's sort of a generalized question because I, I, the few times I have had guests, I've asked them, where do you see cosmic horror stories going in the future? And uh, and I would say in in your case in particular. Since yours is more, say, Clark Ashton Smith or William Hope Hodgson, do you see that a place for heavily fantasy-based cosmic horror as opposed to science and technology-based cosmic horror? Well, I see, I see places for both, actually. And I just, I don't know how much I want to talk about this. I just finished the manuscript and, and gave it to my agent, which is called The Palace. And it takes place at a theater. And it definitely has elements of cosmic horror in it, but I don't think that I would call it a cosmic horror story because okay. it's not focused on that. That's not the, the prime. It's not the primary or only thing that happens. The dread is not the purpose. No, the story. Okay. The story is a story about magic. Okay. And it just so happens that one of the types of magic that they're that they're dealing with is transportational magic. Yay! So yeah, I had a lot of fun with this one. I've from from the pieces of it I've heard, it sounds like a lot of fun. And I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, but I actually have a copy of it, and I can read it before any of you. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> what, I, what I see is, like I said earlier, uh, we have to continue to evolve based on what's already come. The things that made the Lovecraft stories really good for the audience at the time mm -hmm. no longer apply because we have those Lovecraft stories already. They're part of our, you know, our, they're, they're part historical of our historical foundation. Culture. Right. Yeah. So, so now we have to go continue to expand and, and to explore and to go beyond that. You know, there, there are so many different possibilities that have been opened up because of what's come before us. Like uh, Newton, Isaac Newton, I think, it was, who said that he is not a genius. He's just been able to see further than the people that came before him because he's standing it's on, on their shoulders. shoulders. Yep. So I'm paraphrasing that. No, I, 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 I believe it is Isaac Newton. We, we have to continue to move forward and to... Oh, and I believe we are. There, there are definitely authors who are doing this. Continue to move forward and, and, and explore it in different ways. And I think one of those ways now that's happening a lot is, is the, the 
you know, we've had genre for a while where it was rigid. Now, this is horror. This is science right. fiction. This is mystery. This is romance. This is, and over the past twenty years, I've seen those those divisions erode. Yes. And I think if there are going to be divisions again in the future, because there's always going to be marketers. Um, <laughs> so I didn't mean to say that sounding so depressed. Uh, there's always going to be marketers, so there's always going to be those divisions because they're always going to want to try to categorize so that they can sell better. Exactly. But I think authors are paying less attention to those divisions now. And I think audiences are paying less attention to those divisions now. And I think you see it in film as well. Yes. And... Yes, well, especially in horror uh, lately and in television where uh, it's multiple subgenres of horror in one movie or mm -hmm. in one show. Uh, so it is not easy to subclassify, I guess. Right. Um, but, I, but even just beyond horror, like Game of Thrones as an example. Yes, yeah. Uh, that is definitely got horrific elements into in it. But it's also got romance elements in it. Right. But it right. is certainly a sword and sorcery story. Except you wouldn't put it in exactly the same kind of category as Lord of the Rings. No, that to me that's more of a high fantasy or epic fantasy as opposed to what do they call it? See, I Grim think Grimdark? Grimdark okay. fantasy, I think, is what they what they call stuff that's like that's like Conan but super brutal. But we wouldn't have things like Game of Thrones if we didn't five or seven decades earlier, I can't remember, uh, have Lord of the Rings. We wouldn't have had Lord of the Rings if... That's true. Before that, we didn't have, um, you know, the, the, the Greek myths. Or, right. I, I'm skipping a whole lot. There's, there's always a, a path that you can trace. This led to this, led to this. Mm -hmm. you know, like Edgar Allan Poe led to Lovecraft, led to Block, led to King, led mm -hmm. to King. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, so tell us a little bit about your patron... At Patreon? 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 Yeah, none of us know how to pronounce it. Well, I think it's Patreon. I'm not um, even sure they know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and where else we can find you and what you have coming up. Well, the Patreon is uh, just, you know, like patreon.com slash John Urban Sick. Okay. Think, or maybe just Urban Sick. I'm not sure. Uh, and I do a couple of stories every month. There, there are several levels. You can do one story or two stories, or you could also do behind the scenes stuff. I even offer, no one's taking me up on this yet. Oh my. I even offer an hour on the phone to discuss anything you want or need to discuss. See, that to me it I think is a good deal. editing work, it could be um, content stuff, it could be throwing back and forth ideas, it could be complaining about you know, your husband or wife or, <laughs> or, or the children I, it, you know at this point it doesn't really matter and you it's, it's your dime it's that it's the high level the 25 dollars a month you only have to do it one month and you get one call and it'd be great that's true that's true um and, and beyond that i've got my newsletter every month um i'm sorry my newsletter every week i've got my website that i don't update very often darkfluidity.com okay it's, where can people find the newsletter on the website on the website okay we'll lead you to that uh, I know on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Great. I'm usually easy to find. If I'm not under Urban Sick or John Urban Sick, I'm under Dark Fluid. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank this you. was an enlightening and awesome conversation. And we got story time, which the audience really likes. They mm -hmm. like when we, we have stories on. I so, hope so. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, you might enjoy another one that I co host, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, where we talk about pretty much all things horror some things only even you know marginally related to horror and all kinds of other fun stuff you can check out our engineer dave thomas's twitch channel uh twitch.tv slash meteor notes after an extended illness he is uh hopefully coming back to twitch we're going to see how it goes but uh you know check that out and see what he's up to nowadays. Thanks again to Dave for all of his work. Despite despite everything that's going on with him, he is still a trooper. He is still out there engineering for us. And if you enjoyed this episode and want to check out past episodes, future episodes, episodes where time and space meet and then fall apart, uh, and past, present, and future are all one, you can go to the Project Entertainment Network. You can go to Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, I think maybe even iHeartRadio if they're still around. Uh, at pretty much any place where podcasts are available, we are here and we are free. 
And we are up to shenanigans, as always, of cosmic proportions. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week. Bye. How do people who make stuff up for a living make stuff up? New York Times bestseller Jonathan Mayberry told us... Oprah's book club favorite Sue Miller told us... You know, you sort of take a character and make some bad things happen. How do we get them to do that? We colored them, just like at a cocktail party, except through your headphones. Join us every Thursday for the Liars Club Oddcast. A slightly unhinged podcast where storytellers interview other storytellers. Available on Project Entertainment Network, iTunes, and everywhere podcasts are heard.